Well, welcome everyone to day five of the USS. Uh, this is Paul Melvin. I'm one of the steering committee members and Irena Swanson, as you know, is the other one. Uh, I just wanna make a brief announcement. Irena and I have prepared a um, survey to discuss your experience, your engagement, your concerns and so forth from the first week of this uh, summer school. So that is not yet online, but it will go out to you. It's a survey monkey uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we would very much like your responses by Saturday evening, if possible, if not then, certainly by Sunday noon. Uh, and we will try to um, act on those. So that's all I have to say and welcome and Akhil, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so let me set up the um, screen share. Um, Um, right. So yeah. So I guess um, right. So 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 last time we introduced uh, um, introduced this construction of the uh, the piadic numbers. Um, so last time, um, right. So we introduced the field QP for prime number P. And so let's just recall that this was uh, so this was a complete. So this is a complete non-Archimedean field. So sorry. So I mean that QP is equipped with some sort of it's a, it's equipped with the piadic absolute value, so an extension of the piadic absolute value on the rational numbers. So this is a complete non-Archimedean field. So with an absolute value. Um, and um, right, so it was it was defined as the completion of the rational numbers with respect to this absolute value, sort of analogous. It was sort of defined as somehow analogous to the real numbers, um, the way the real numbers are defined as a completion with respect to the the usual Archimedean absolute value. And uh, right, so we so we also saw last time um, that you can sort of represent uh, an element of QP. You can you can represent it by a by a piadic expansion. So expand elements of QP uh, via a piadic expansion. So you can write uh, an element of the form like a sum of a, a sub i times p to the i as i ranges over all integers, but it, it sort of starts at some minus n for some n large enough and um, goes to infinity. Uh, and the a i's uh, are between zero and uh, p minus one. Okay, so um, yeah, so QP is is constructed as a um, I mean, it's constructed as a completion of of uh, of the rational numbers, and it's sort of supposed to be kind of like kind of analogous to the construction of the real numbers as completion of the rational numbers. Um, and in general, whenever you do sort of when whenever you have a completion process, it, it usually becomes much easier to solve um, solve equations in a completion because now there's more uh, more room to maneuver. So for example, it's much easier to solve polynomial equation or to, well, to show that there, there is a solution of a polynomial equation over the real numbers uh, than over the rational numbers. So over the real numbers, if you're given a polynomial, so given a polynomial f of x in r of x, uh, then you can detect roots. Well, let's say, let's say your polynomial just has simple roots. Um, uh, then you can detect at least simple roots by looking for changes of signs. So you can detect existence of roots by looking at sign changes. And uh, when we're over the piadic numbers, there's no longer going to be an ordering. So, um, uh, so in fact, there's, there's no way of ordering QP because minus one is going to be a sum of squares. Um, but uh, similarly, but well, somehow analogously, uh, the, the ways that you can, you can look for um, um, you can look for solutions of polynomial equations over the over the piadic numbers, and these come from 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 looking at congruences. Um, so I want to formulate sort of a general tool for uh, for, for for producing solutions uh, of polynomial equations over the piadic numbers. And so this tool is called Hensel's lemma. Um, oh, so sorry, I apologize. 
So there's some drilling that just started in the background. And so if it becomes noticeable, please let me know. And I will try to switch devices in such a way that may or may not help with that. Okay. Um, so, um, right. So Hensel's lemma is the, the following statement. So let f of x uh, be a polynomial in uh, zp brackets x. And Hensel's lemma is going to produce, is going to give a criterion for, um, for the existence of a, um, of a solution of f of x. So let alpha be an element of zp uh, with, with the following properties. So, so first of all, uh, it's sort of an approximate root of the function f. So f of alpha has p at absolute value less than one, uh, but the derivative is not too small. So the value of the function is absolute value less than one, but the value of the derivative, uh, so f prime of alpha has absolute value equal to one. Um, so then the conclusion is uh, there exists a unique element beta in ZP such that alpha minus beta is less than one and f of beta is equal to zero. So it's saying that if you have, you have sort of an approximate root of, uh, of the function, uh, function f and uh, its derivative is not too small, then you can refine that uniquely if you're within a discrepatis one, uh, well, open discrepatis one uh, to an actual solution of, of your equation. Um, okay. So uh, another formulation of this, right? So, so if you take f of x as a polynomial over the p-adic numbers, but you can reduce f of x to get a, a polynomial f bar of x, which lives over, uh, uh, which lives over fp. So, so, so you can reduce, reduce mod p and you get a polynomial uh, with coefficients in fp. Um, and if this polynomial has a simple root, which I'll call alpha bar, so alpha bar is the reduction of alpha mod p. So, so saying that f of alpha is less than one is saying that f bar of x has a, um, has a root at alpha bar. And the second condition is saying that the root is simple, then this root lifts uniquely to a root, uh, well, let's call it beta in ZP of the actual uh, polynomial that we started with F. So if you have a, solu if you have a, if you have a solution of your equation mod P uh, and it's a simple, simple root, so the derivative doesn't vanish uh, at, that, at that point, then you can, uh, you can upgrade that to a solution in, in the p-adic uh, integers and it's, it's unique within its congruence class. Uh, so this is Hensel's sum. Well, there, in fact, there are many different formulations of Hensel's sum, and this is one, you know, one formulation or one, one case of it. Um, okay, so I want to give sort of a proof sketch of Hensel's sum. Uh, and the proof sketch is basically use Newton's method. Uh, so use Newton's method to uh, refine alpha. Uh, to the root beta. So alpha is sort of a, an approximate solution. Uh, and then you're going to sort of iterate the, uh, this, well, this process. Um, and then it's going to converge uh, in the limit uh, to, um, to the, the solution beta of, of the equation. Um, so explicitly what, what this means is that you define a sequence. So you define a sequence uh, of p integers. Uh, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, dot, 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 such that alpha zero equals alpha. And uh, right, so inductively, you're gonna define alpha n plus one. So, so you're gonna use Newton's method. So, so that means that, uh, um, I mean, you, you have your sort of approximate solution alpha n, and then you wanna sort of wiggle it a little bit to get a better solution. And the amount of, the amount you're supposed to change the solution or the approximate solution is, is given by linearly approximating your function at that point. So the formula is alpha n plus one equals alpha n minus f of alpha n uh, over f prime of alpha. Uh, and so notice here that we're doing a division. And so we want it, so in order for this to work well, we want to be dividing by something which is not too small, which is exactly this condition that uh, you know, we're starting with an element alpha such that f prime of alpha 
has absolute value one as a p-adic unit. So we can sort of divide by it without causing too many problems. Um, okay, so then what's going to happen is that, uh, so, so this is exactly right. So this is exactly the procedure of Newton's method. Uh, and then what you find is that the p-adic absolute values of alpha n are going to converge to zero as n goes to infinity. Uh, and in fact, alpha n is a, is a Cauchy sequence. Uh, which is going to converge to the limit beta. Uh, and, and that's going to be the root of your polynomial. Um, right. So, so essentially the, uh, you know, so the way, the way that you prove this is that, uh, um, um, right. So, I mean, the way that you prove this is essentially you prove that F of alpha N, N plus one, is, um, is going to be less than the absolute value of f of alpha n. I think even you can put a square here, or maybe less than or equal to, well, so let me just say it this way. Um, so it's going to converge very rapidly. And, and the reason is that, uh, um, you're going to use the Taylor approximation of f near alpha. So, um, right, so specifically you're gonna use that f of alpha n plus one is equal to f of alpha n plus f prime of alpha n times uh, alpha n plus one minus alpha n, which is minus f of alpha n divided by f prime of alpha n plus big O of the difference squared. So big O of F of alpha N divided by F prime of alpha N squared. So I think that means we get to, we get to say this in our inequality. Um, and this is, this, is, this is, I mean, this is the Taylor expansion. So, so, so there's no issue with the Taylor expansion because you're just working with polynomials. And I mean, you have to check a little bit that the Taylor expansion is okay, that, uh, that, that you have this and the denominators in the Taylor expansion don't sort of cause problems. Um, but essentially what you're going to use is that if you have a polynomial minus, minus the linear approximation at a point, you're going to, you know, it's going to be divisible by like X minus alpha, alpha N squared at that point. Um, so, right, so then you observe that these two terms, the first two terms are just going to cancel. So this is big O of F of alpha N divided by F prime of alpha N um, squared. Um, and so then that's going to, that's going to show that since you started with something where the value of F was less than one, it's actually going to converge very rapidly. The f of alpha n are going to converge very rapidly to zero. Um, okay. So, so this is really, I mean, this is really, again, this is really the construction of um, uh, of Newton's method, um, um, which you probably have seen over the real numbers. Uh, but in fact, the con you know all these questions involving like convergences are, and so forth are 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 a lot easier in the setting because one is that you're working with polynomials, but I mean, sort of more saliently is that you're working in a non-Archimedean setting. So instead of the triangle inequality for, uh, for bounding absolute values, you, you have a non-Archimedean property. Um, okay, so yeah, so maybe that's, I, I'll leave it at that. I think, um, so on the problem set, you'll explore this. I mean, there are many, there are actually many ways you can formulate the proof of Newton's method and maybe you'll explore this a little bit more on the, um, on the homework. Um, but let, I mean, just, just sort of to give an idea of, of how this is going, um, essentially, uh, what what you want to do is that this is a this is a proof by successive approximation. Um, and so that's sort of made very clear in this uh, in this procedure via Newton's method. But you could also sort of formulate it in a maybe slightly more um, well in a, in a slightly more direct but maybe less efficient fashion, which is that what you're trying to do is you want you want a beta such that f of beta is equal to zero. And so, so beta is given by some, some p-adic expansion. So, so, so beta has a p-adic expansion. And well, the, you're trying to find beta such that the first p-adic digit or the zeroth p-adic digit, I guess, is the same as the zeroth p-adic digit of alpha. And after that, well, after that, you have to find the rest of the p-adic digits. And right, so the observation is that the first n p-adic digits 
of f of beta depend on the first n piadic digits of beta. Uh, and then you sort of inductively solve for each of the piadic digits. So what you do is you sort of inductively solve for the piadic digits of beta. So again, this is not unlike how you might, you know, try to solve such an equation over over uh, over the real numbers. You sort of, you know, you first work out the first n digits of the decimal expansion, and then you work out the next one, and and so forth. Then you sort of go, you do the same thing in this in this piadic context, except that the expansion is going in the opposite direction. Um, yeah, so so it really is very analogous to how you you would try to solve some sort of equation over the real numbers. Okay, but so let me give some examples of this. Um, so first, let me give an example which uh, which came up on the exercises yesterday. Um, so let me assume that uh, so let me assume that p is greater than two, and let's consider the polynomial uh, x to the p minus one minus one. Right. So 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 this is this is a polynomial and uh, in z p brackets x and uh, Right, so when you reduce mod p, it's, uh, it takes zero at all the classes of fp. So if you have any element of fp, it's, it's p minus first power, or sorry, if you have any non-zero element of fp, it's p minus first power is equal to one. So recall that u to the p minus one is equal to one if u is any element of fp cross, because fp cross is a cyclic group of order p minus one. So any element x with which belongs to zp minus p times zp, so any element which is a p-adic unit, has satisfies that the absolute value of x to the p minus one minus one is less than one. Uh, however, the derivative is not zero. Uh, so, but the derivative, uh, but the derivative is p minus one times x to the p minus two. Um, so this is a p-adic unit. And so then what Hensel's lemma is saying that you have this sort of approximate root of the polynomial x to the p minus one minus one. So in fact, any element, any piadic unit is, um, is sort of an approximate root of the polynomial x to the p minus one minus one. Oh, sorry. So uh, this means a set theoretic difference. So this means all x in the ZP such that the piadic absolute value of x is equal to, equal to one. Okay. Yeah. So a conclusion is that in each congruence class of, uh, of ZP, except the zero congruence class, in each congruence class mod P, except zero, there is a, a P minus first root of unity. Um, so, I mean, I guess a way of saying this in terms of in terms of groups is that you can take the piadic integers and take the group of units, and this maps to the units in FP cross, which is the Z mod P minus one, and in fact, this produces a well a canonical section of that map. So, so, so that's saying that you can, um, you know, that that that's saying that for for this element, you know, for each each congruence class mod P except zero. You're, you're producing a p minus first root of unity um, uh, in, in the pre-image. And in fact, that's unique by the uniqueness part of Hensel's sum. Right, so I, in fact, I didn't, I didn't actually prove the uniqueness part of Hensel's sum. I think the existence proof is more or less gonna imply that, but in fact, you're going to do that on, you're going to see that on the exercises, so. Um, okay. Okay, so conclusion is that QP Contains the p, p minus one p minus one uh, a primitive p minus first root of unity, and you see that by looking at this polynomial x to the p minus one minus one that has that has a solution that has solutions mod p. In fact, every every element not zero uh, of f p is a is a solution and it's a simple root. So you can lift that to to roots in z p. 
Um, so I think on the problem set uh, yesterday, there's, there's sort of another way of producing it explicitly. Uh, so on the problem set, there's an explicit way of producing this, which is that you start with any element X, which again is uh, in ZP, ZP cross, uh, and then consider the sequence X, X to the P, X to the P squared, dot, dot, dot. And this converges periodically. to a p minus first root of unity, which is congruent mod p to x. So in this case, you can really, um, I mean, you can really produce this, uh, and you can produce this via an explicit limiting process by sort of raising to lots of uh, p powers, but Hensel's lemma works sort of very generally. So what's another example of this? So let P be a prime number such that P is congruent to one modulo four. So then uh, the square root of minus one uh, belongs to QP. So I guess, yeah, so technically this is a, this is a special case of the previous, um, uh, previous example. So, so this is a special case of, Uh, but right, so we can also do this very explicitly. So we can consider the equation x squared plus one uh, in FP. Uh, and this equation has a root uh, because P is congruent to one mod four. It's, it's necessarily a simple root uh, because the derivative is two x. And then you apply Hensel's sum. So, uh, right. So in fact, sort of thinking more about this and thinking more about Hensel's lemma, it lets you completely determine which elements of the piadic numbers are, are squares. So uh, Hensel's lemma gives a complete determination of which elements of QP cross, uh, so which non-zero piadic numbers are squares, and uh, in particular determines uh, the structure of the group QP cross modulo QP cross squared. So this is this is a group we want to sort of have access to if we're going to think about quadratic forms over QP. Okay, so let's. Let's start to do this. Um, so let, let me do this when P is greater than two. So, um, so this, this determination um, is gonna be a little bit more complicated when P is equal to two, uh, because then when you take the derivative of something like X squared minus A, you pick up a factor of two, which is not a, not a two attic unit. Um, but when P is greater than two, we can do this pretty explicitly as, as follows. Um, so if we're given an element u in zp cross, then Hensel's lemma implies that u admits a square root uh, if and only if the reduction mod uh, mod p, which lives in fp cross, admits a square root. Uh, so namely you apply Hansel's lemma to the polynomial x squared minus u. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, right. In general, if we're given some element of, of QP cross, so if we're given some element in um, some non-zero piadic number, we can always uh, so we can always write it 
as some power of p, so let's say p to the i, times uh, a p-adic unit u cross. So where i is an integer and u is an zp cross. And uh, right, so if this is going to be a square, then necessarily i is even, because necessarily if you have a square, then the p-adic valuation has to be even. Um, and then what we've seen is that it's sort of it's a necessary and sufficient condition in order for this element to be a square, which is that i should be even and u should be a unit, uh, you should be a square mod p. So this is a square in qp cross if and only if i is even and uh, let's say u bar in fp cross is a square. And so the conclusion is that we've determined the structure of the group qp cross mod qp cross squared, namely it's z mod two cross z mod two. And uh, where do these factors come from? Well, on the one hand you have p, so p is, p is not a square because its p-adic valuation is one. And uh, over here you can take any non quadratic non-residue. So let's say some u in zp cross such that u bar is not a square. So u bar in fp cross is not a square. Um, and so you get the structure of qp cross mod qp cross squared as z mod two cross z mod two in this case. Um, right, Akil, so that's- I think there might be a question. Oh, yes, please. Yes, um, so for this reduction of a p-adic number to the field f p, how does that work? Uh, Right, so, uh, sorry, so you mean this construction u bar? Yes, exactly. Right, so for this, um, okay, so if you, if, you, if you consider the ring zp, we can take the quotient. So, so zp is, is, is gonna be the, the subring of qp consisting of elements of norm at most one. And inside zp, we have the multiples of p. So these are equivalently the elements that uh, have uh, p-adic absolute value less than one, so p times zp. And this quotient is the same as fp. I mean, if you think about p-adic oh. expansion, so right, so explicitly, if you think about p-adic expansions and any p-adic number, it, it has a p-adic expansion and we're just remembering what happens in, in, in level zero. Sweet, and so this, like we avoid the possibility of dividing by p since we're not working with qp as a whole, but just yes. with the subring as Sweet, exactly. thank you so much. So any p-adic integer is of the form sum of a i times p to the i, where i goes from zero to infinity. And then we're mapping this to fp by sending this to the class of a i, oh, sorry, a zero. So, right. right, and so this is, I mean, this is sort of, I guess, maybe fun to work out sort of explicitly because uh, like if you want to find, if you want to actually find a square root, um, you can, you know, you can try to, like however you might try to calculate a square root, the decimal expansion of a square root, you can you can do that in this case as well and sort of inductively work out the AIs. Okay, so Hensel's lemma completely determines the structure uh, of this group QP cross mod QP cross squared. Um, it's a little trickier for P equals two. Um, so what you can show, so it's, it's not necessarily true that, uh, um, so it, it's not so easy to see, or it takes a little bit more work to see when a two attic unit is a square, um, because Hensel's lemma is going to run into problems now because you have squares. And so when you take the derivative, it's, it's, it's zero mod two. Um, but what you can show is that, which I think you'll see this on the, the problem set, that any element u in z2 cross such that u minus one is divisible by eight uh, is necessarily a square. And you can see this either using uh, sort of a slightly uh, more general version of Hensel's lemma uh, than the one that I, that I stated uh, just earlier, where, where you don't necessarily have a 
simple root modulo p, but instead like the value of your function is a lot smaller than the value of the derivative. Um, or you can see this, well, it's sort of equivalent by sort of changing variables um, in, a, uh, in a clever way. Um, so, the, right, so the conclusion in this case uh, is that q2 cross mod q2 cross squared is isomorphic to z mod two cross z mod two cross z mod two. And as generators, well, you have two. So, so because the two adic valuation of any square is necessarily even. And here you can take minus one and five to be, to be generators, to be sort of basis elements for this um, F2 vector space Q2 cross mod Q2 cross square. So, right, so it's a little bit more complicated at, at the prime two um, when you're talking about squares in this way. But you can still you can still work it out pretty explicitly. And in particular, something that's kind of nice about the piadic numbers is that if you look at units modulo squares, you've got a finite group. So this is sort of one way in which the, the piadic numbers, so I mean that's also true for the real numbers. Uh, I mean, that's one way in which the um, you know the two adic numbers are a lot simpler than something like the rational numbers, because whether or not something is a square is sort of a finite condition. Okay. Sorry, maybe I should pause for more questions here. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, so now let's apply this to, um, to quadratic forms. quadratic forms over the field QP. Um, and let's try to understand what are uh, quadratic forms over QP, when can we classify them, you know, when are they isotropic and so forth. Um, and so the first step in, in somehow doing that was to think about um, um, uh, units modulo, modulo squares in, in QP. So, um, right, so let's fix a quadratic form. Let's call this brackets A1 through AN over QP. So the AIs are living in QP cross. And let's imagine we want to try to sort of classify these. So the first thing that we can do is we can, well, if we wanted to classify something like this, we can, we can multiply all the AIs by square classes. Um, and uh, right, so, so in particular, we can multiply everything by even powers of P. So by rescaling, what we can always do is we can write it in the form um, say u1 through ur direct sum pv1 through pvs where the uis and the vis live in zp cross. So by multiplying by some even powers of p everywhere, we can assume that the ais are all either p-adic units or like p times p-adic units. So we can sort of break it up into, into two pieces like this. Um, right, and so it turns out that if p is greater than two, this so sort we're of breaking it, breaking it up in this way and using the classification of quadratic forms over uh, over FP is going to give a complete classification of quadratic forms over QP. So if P is greater than two, which again is is the assumption that makes everything much simpler uh, when you're talking about quadratic forms in this context, um, we can use this to completely classify over QP. So namely, the idea is that if you have a quadratic form over QP, well, you can break it up in this way, and then you can reduce each piece mod P. And so you can reduce the UIs mod P and you can reduce the VIs mod P to give you quadratic forms over FP. 
And if p is greater than two, then this essentially gives you a sort of more or less canonical decomposition of, um, of quadratic forms um, over QP. So. Okay, so since we've been saying things in terms of, um, I mean, right, so since we introduced this, this vit ring, I wanna, I wanna try to formulate things uh, in terms of the vit ring. Um, uh, or in terms of this, um, right, so what's going to happen is that the vit ring of QP, uh, at least as an abelian group, is isomorphic to two copies of the vit group of FP. Okay, so um, right, so I want to make the following construction. Um, right, so, so to see this fact, what, I, what I'm essentially going to do is to reverse the above construction. So let u1 bar through ur bar be a quadratic form over fb. So let's say I have a quadratic form living over, over the field FB. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a quadratic form over QP. So you can produce quadratic form over QP by lifting UI bar to a piadic unit UI. And then what you do is you send u1 bar through ur bar to u1 dot 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 ur. So note that, right, so there's, there's some non-uniqueness. There's some non-uniqueness in the choice of lifts. So there is non-uniqueness in the choice of the UI, but all the unique, all the non-uniqueness is up to scaling by square factors. Right? Because if you have if you have two if you have two different choices of U1, then their 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 quotient is, is congruent to one mod P, and therefore it's a, it's a square since P is greater than two. Um, so so yeah, so this is um, so, so the choice of the UI is, is, is not relevant. Um, and in fact, this gives a well-defined well-defined map from, let's say, uh, isomorphism classes of quadratic forms over FP to isoclasses of forms over QP. So, so this is not this is not uh, sort of immediately obvious because uh, in order to define this map, I've sort of chosen a diagonalization. I've said let's. Let's take a quadratic form over FP. Let's, let's put it in this diagonal form U1 bar through UR bar, and let's lift it to this uh, diagonal form U1 through UR. Um, but in fact, one has to argue that this is actually independent of, um, this is actually well-defined up to isomorphism. It only depends on the isomorphism class of quadratic forms over, over FP. Um, and in fact, this is something that now we have the tools to do using the chain equivalence theorem. So I guess in this case, you could, You'd probably just check it directly because isomorphism classes of quadratic forms over. So you, I think in this case you could you could sort of check it directly, um, but um, in fact you can see this. Using Vitz chain equivalence theorem. So, I mean, if 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 you were to change the 
the sequence u1 bar through u r bar in such a way that you get the same quadratic form mod p, then the only way that can happen is that if you do this particular sequence of moves on the u1 bar through u r bar, you know, this particular sequence of moves that we saw, like you can multiply something by a square, you can interchange two consecutive elements, or you can do this one, um, I mean, this one extra, extra construction that comes from a suitable change of basis. And the observation is that if you, if you do any of those moves on the u1 bar through ur bar, you can also do those, you can do the exact same moves on the other side, u1 through ur. And so if you sort of think about this, it's, it's saying that the, the moves that you're allowed to do on the, you know, on the, on the diagonal form of graph p, you can, um, you can do them on the, on the right-hand side as well. Sorry, so there's a question, right, so how do you lift, um, how do you lift ui bar to ui? Um, so any, any, any lift is okay. So, right, so I mean, the lift is coming from, so, so zp mod p times zp is equal to fp. And so if we have an element in fp cross, we're saying let's, let's, let's pick some element of the preimage. So, so, so some element of, of zp cross, such that mod p, it's, it's that element of fp. Um, and that's not unique. So that's, that's not gonna be unique, but if you have any two such choices, they're gonna differ by a square, their quotient is gonna be a square. Um, so for the purposes of writing down the associated quadratic form, it's not going to affect the isomorphism class. Right, so this produces a map uh, of, uh, right, so this is gonna produce a map. In fact, it's a, it's a ring map. So it's gonna produce a map of commutative rings which goes from the vit ring of FP to the vit ring of QP. And again, P is greater than two for this. Um, because in order for this to be well defined, we need, we need this, um, we need to take P, um, P odd. Um, and so this, this map is sending, right, sorry, I guess I should say GW here because we said isomorphism crosses. So this is sending brackets U1 bar through UR bar to brackets U1 through UR. Um, right, and so this, this produces a map of commutative rings, which is some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of lifting, lifting construction. Um, so let's call this map phi. We can also produce another map, the map P times phi, or let's say, yeah, P times, I guess brackets P times phi, I should say, which, sends brackets u1 through ur to uh, brackets pu1. So it's exactly, it's exactly the previous construction, but you've, you've rescaled everything by p. Um, and again, this is going to be well defined because it's uh, so so it's 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 literally brackets p times uh, times the map phi, uh, and so one obtains a map from G W of F P direct sum G W of F P um, into G W of Q P. Sorry, so there's a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah so um. Just to confirm, so the map phi is sort of a section of that um, restriction down to the finite field, but the map brackets p phi is not a section, right? Right, so it's not, I guess I'm not sure I would say it that way because there's no map. So this is kind of a funny map because there's no, there's no map in either direction between qp and, uh, and fp. I mean, there's a map from zp to fp. Mm -hmm. And I guess we did not talk about, or we did not try to define Groton gate fit rings for something which is not a field. So I guess you could, you could indeed phrase it as saying it's, I guess, yeah, I think you could phrase it this way, that it's, it's something going from the Groton gate fit ring of FP to the Groton gate fit ring of ZP appropriately defined. And then you're composing that with the map to the Groton gate fit ring of QP. But I think explicitly, I'm just sort of thinking about it in coordinates. Like you have a, you know, you have a quadratic form over FP, 
And then you lift that to like a diagonal form, you lift that to a quadratic form over ZP and then consider that as over QP. And it's not completely obvious that that's well-defined and you know, independent of the various choices that you've made along the way. But in fact, that is the case and that's using that P is greater than two. Okay, so, right, so you obtain a map like this and this is the map phi and P times phi. Um, and um, so this map is, so, so this map as we've seen is basically surjective. So this, uh, because if you have any quadratic form over QP, well, you, you, know, you can break it up as, as, as we saw over here, you can sort of break it up into um, a diagonal form involving a bunch of copies of uh, piatic units and P times a bunch of piatic units. Um, so that's gonna tell you that this map is surjective. It's not quite injective. Uh, so it's not quite injective. Uh, and it's not injective because brackets one minus one is the same thing as uh, P times that. So it's the same thing as brackets P minus P. These are both the hyperbolic plane. Uh, but somehow that's the only redundancy. That's, it turns out that, uh, so it's a theorem of Springer, Uh, and uh, right, so in fact, GW of QP is the quotient of GW of FP direct sum GW of FP by the, well, I guess by the hyperbolic plane and minus the hyperbolic plane or the Vit group of QP is isomorphic to the Vit group of FP, direct sum the Vit group of FP. So, I mean, essentially what this is saying is that, yeah, so this is saying that a quadratic form over QP, so if you like an anisotropic quadratic form over QP, and an anisotropic quadratic form, It gives you to give an anisotropic quadratic form over QP is the same as giving a pair of anisotropic quadratic forms over FP. And namely what you do is you, you, lift the, you lift each of the anisotropic forms over FP to, to ZP or over QP, and then you multiply one of them, you rescale one of them by P. So this is essentially the, the sort of classification of quadratic forms over QP when P is greater than two. Um, it's in terms of essentially a pair of quadratic forms over FP modulo this, this redundancy involving the hyperbolic plane and in particular, there's the following, well, I guess it's sort of a corollary or you can prove it directly, which is that any quadratic form over QP in at least five variables is isotropic. Um, there is, in fact, an anisotropic quadratic form of of dimension four. So uh, the U invariant of QP uh, is exactly four. Right, so you know, so why why is something like so? So let me maybe I should end. So maybe let me end by at least explaining the proof of this. So you can prove this by sort of examining the above proof. If you have a quadratic form in at least five variables, well, then you break it up into like sort of a quadratic form involving piatic units and p times a quadratic form involving piatic units. And if you have at least five variables, then one of those two pieces must have at least three variables. And now if you have a quadratic form in three variables over FP, we know that's isotropic. 
And so in particular, it contains a hyperbolic plane. And that, well, that's going to mean that over QP, it also contains a hyperbolic plane. So this really follows from the, the previous uh, arguments. But I also want to explain, I mean, this is sort of equivalent, but I also just want to explain this kind of directly. So explicitly, if you have a quadratic form, say in five variables, um, so let's say your quadratic form, I mean, again, you, you, it's, it's some diagonal form A1 through A5. And by sort of rescaling by even powers of P, you can assume that it's at the form, let's say, brackets U1, U2, brackets PV1, PV2, PV3, where the UIs and the VIs are, are p units. And what we want to do is we want to see that this is um, uh, want to see that this is isotropic. And to see that this is isotropic, well, in fact, just the, this last part, this PV1, PV2, PV3 is going to be isomorphic, uh, isotropic. So in fact, Uh, and that, in fact, well, that's equivalent to saying that V1, V2, V3 is isotropic because you're solving a homogeneous equation. Um, and to see this in turn, what you need is a solution of uh, V1, X1 squared plus V2, X2 squared plus V3, X3 squared equals zero. So this equation has a solution over FB. By Hensel's lemma. So this has a solution, let's say x1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar over FP by, uh, sorry, not by Hensel's lemma because, uh, because quadratic forms in three variables over FP are isotropic. And uh, this is a right. So this is not a this is a non-trivial solution. So so one of the x i bar is so this is a non-zero solution. Um, and then you can lift this to a solution over uh, over z p uh, or or f p using Hensel's lemma, right? Because so so one so well Hensel's lemma was formulated as a one variable statement, but essentially so let's suppose x one is not zero. So let's, or let's suppose x1 bar is in, in this solution mod p is not zero. And then we're going to consider this equation. We'll just pick any x2 and x3 that lift x2 bar and x3 bar and consider it as a function of x1 bar. Um, and so it's a one variable, you know, then, then it's really just a one variable polynomial. And it has a root mod p. It's necessarily a simple root because, um, you know, because it's a quadratic polynomial. Um, and, and then using Hansel Thelma, you can, you can lift this to a solution over ZP using Hansel Thelma. So just fix two of the variables. Okay, so this is, this is really, um, so this is really a fundamental feature of QP, which is that quadratic forms in at least five variables are isotropic. Um, so I guess I didn't quite get to prove that there is an anisotropic quadratic form of dimension four. So maybe I'll pick that up on Monday. Um, also, right. So, so, so far I've been working for P greater than two, which makes things a lot easier. But in fact, this result is also true when P is equal to two. So that's, this corollary is also true when P equals two, uh, but you have to work a little bit harder to prove it. You have to work a little bit harder to prove it uh, because for example, being a square is a, is a more complicated condition. And because applying Hensel's lemma is a little bit trickier because now you're going to have repeated roots mod two. So you're going to have to apply, for example, some sort of refined, you know, some sort of more general version of Hensel's lemma, um, which you will sort of explore on the exercises. Uh, but in fact, this, um, this corollary is, um, is still true over, over Q2 with, with a little bit more, more work.
Okay, so I guess I will I will stop here for today and we'll continue. I guess I think we'll go into sort of more details. I'll try to put some more details of these arguments and what you need for this on, on the problem set um, because I'm uh, a little bit rushed at the end. And otherwise I'm gonna, yeah, gonna continue on continue on Monday. So um oh, sorry, so yeah, so I'll stick around a little bit for questions. You know? Um so there's a question. Uh Right, so so in in this the proof of this corollary, I, I considered a quadratic form the form u one u two p v one p v two p v three, but the same argument would also work if you have u one u two u three and then p v one p v two I guess, because you would say that the the first three terms are isotropic. So this works similarly for u one u two u3, and then pv1, pv2. Namely, you would show that this particular, you would, you would show that the first, uh, first piece of the quadratic form involving the three p-adic units, this part itself is already isotropic. Well, it's isotropic mod p, and uh, well, it's isotropic mod p, and then you can lift that using Hansel's lemma to show that it's actually isotropic in qp. Um, okay. Next question was what? Why does where does the argument fail for just three variables over QP? So, okay, that's a good question. I'm going to I'm definitely going to put more details on this in the problem set. But um, if you just had three variables, right? So let me give the example or even a four variables of something which is not isotropic. So so, so maybe I should yeah should be more. Okay, so so let's say one comma u one comma u bar is an isotropic over over FP, um, right? So IE minus U bar is not a square. So let's, let's pick some anisotropic form of, um, um, of dimension two over FP. And then let's lift U bar to U in ZP cross. So again, it doesn't matter which lift because it's all gonna, you know, it's all gonna vary up to a square. Uh, and then the claim is that the form one comma u p comma p u is anisotropic over q p. So again, I'm assuming p is greater than two, right? And so, so I'm going to put this on the I'm going to put this on the problem set. But I mean, so let's let's suppose, you know, so let's suppose that you had x1 squared plus u times x2 squared plus p times x3 squared plus pu times x4 squared equals zero over qp. So, so let's suppose you had a solution uh, of this equation over qp and we wanna get a contradiction. Um, so, um, so without loss of generality, can assume that the xi's actually live in zp, right? So you can so by rescaling your, your solution, you can assume that it's a vector that lives in, in zp, and you can assume that not all the xi's are divisible by p, right? So, so you have x1, x2, x3, and x4, they're, they're all in ZP, but not all of them are divisible by P. And now you sort of have to split into two cases. So suppose, for example, that X1 is a p-adic unit, and then you, you, just, you just reduce the thing mod P. So if you reduce mod P, you get that X1 bar squared plus U times X2 bar squared equals zero, and this is a contradiction. Because, because this doesn't have any non-trivial roots. So, so if either x1 or x2 is in zp cross, then already you get a contradiction because you can look at what happens mod p and you find that this quadratic form reduced mod p has a, has a, has a non-trivial solution, which we've assumed does not happen. Um, conversely, suppose x1 and x2 are divisible by p, but one of x3 and x4 
lives in ZP cross. Uh, and then you do the same thing, but you reduce, well, then you do the same thing, but you first divide everything by P. So then if you call this star, then the left-hand side of star is divisible by P. And uh, if you divide by P, it's not zero. So it's, well, but it's not zero mod P squared. So if X3 or X4 is not zero mod P, then you observe that uh, when you consider the sum of four terms, the first two terms are divisible by P squared, but the second, the sum of the second two terms is cannot be zero mod P squared, because again, uh, one comma U is not uh, isotropic mod P. Okay, sorry. So I'm, I think I'm gonna put this, I, I will put this on the problem set so we can work through it in a little bit more detail, but um, yeah, so this is how you construct an anisotropic form in four variables over a QP. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. So there's a little bit more discussion in the chat, um, which I think is, um, is good. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. More questions? Oh, can I can I ask you a question, please? Yes, please. Sorry, I don't always see the hands, so please just. Oh, ask sorry. I, yeah. I just. So basically, I wanted to. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I still here. Yes, it's not this oh. yeah. Okay. okay. Hope, hope everything's fine. <laughs> so. Yeah. I just wanted to double check basically whether I, I understood the uh, your your proof about why the U invariant of QP is less than or equal to four. So the idea is that if I have a, 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 a form of dimension five, a quadratic form of dimension five over QP, then well we have this we have this orthogonal direct sum where you know I have a part which uh, reduces to un to uh, FP star and a part that reduces to well zero modulo FP. So I have this U, U, the, the UIs and the PVIs, and mm -hmm. one of those and one of those two parts must have dimension at least three. So if I reduce it to FP, then because the U, U invariant of FP is two, there's a hyperbolic plane that's split. And then if I lift that, I still have a, hyper, a hyperbolic plane that's split. Therefore, I have isotropy in my original form, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's you great. can also say it without using the words hyperbolic plane, which is, I mean, so you can also say it using Hansel's lemma, which is that you have a, I mean, you have a solution when you've reduced the, like you have a solution, let's say the first piece has dimension at least three, and then that has a solution mod P, and then you lift that to a, a solution using Hansel's lemma. You can also phrase it in terms of the hyperbolic oh, plane. Oh yeah, said. yeah, I see, I see, that's yeah. great, thank you, thanks. Yeah, so, so, so for example, this is gonna tell you that if you have a, this, this argument, so maybe I'll put this on the palm side again. So if you, if you have a, um, a, if you have a field, um, if you have a field of characteristic not two, then the U invariant of the power series or the Laurent series field over that field is going to be twice the U invariant of the field that you started with. Oh, I, yeah, I can see how this could relate to the case of why U of FP is two and U of QP is, is four, because we can right. think of that as some kind of Laurent series in the case of QP for, with a piadic expansion, right? Yes. Oh, I see. That's great. Thank you. I mean, I, yeah, so I guess the, the, the more general statement would be um, like if you, I mean, so so FP, Laurent series T and QP, I and mean, what's sort of analogous about them is that they both have uh, complete discrete valuations. Um, so discrete, I mean, evaluation, I mean, we saw like the p attic valuation, you can also do a t attic valuation for FP, Laurent series T. Yeah. And being discrete means that the, the, the value, the valuations are all integers. Um, and um, so it, it, you can really formulate it as a statement about um, complete discretely valued fields. With the, so this would be the t-valuation from the exercise set from yesterday. Is that that's right. the, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Thank you, Akia. Yeah, thanks.
And thanks everybody for wearing PCMI t-shirts for our special day. Has everybody gotten one? Yeah, some of you are wearing it, yes. Um, I right. did not get mine because you were sent to a wrong address. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I'll see you in my office hours. Okay. All right, well, I'll see you, see you all either in office hours or um, on Monday. Have a nice weekend.